Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to worship <laughs> with the St. Andrew's congregation here at Omond United Church. So for those of you viewing on the YouTube, this may not look like the St. Andrew's Sanctuary, and indeed it is not, because we are the kind recipients of the hospitality of Omond that have invited us to come and meet in their space until we're sure that our sanctuary is all warmed up. So we hope to be back there shortly. It is good to gather as community, to be together in worship, to see familiar faces and to support one another on our faith journey. There are a few announcements that I want to share and bring to your attention this morning. And the first of them you're not going to find in your newsletter. Um, I think Kim has a slide. Um, okay. Uh, we are planning, we being the Cooperative United Churches in North Bay, are planning next Friday evening at 7 o'clock to have a peace vigil for, the, for Ukraine. It will be downtown, it will be outside. We think we have a spot, but it hasn't been confirmed yet. So you need to visit our website or our Facebook page in order to keep up to date this week as to where it will be. But all the United Church clergy in the city that are walking with congregations have indicated they will participate. We've already had some interest from the wider public so we hope that you will think about gathering next Friday. And who knows what the situation will be as we gather almost a week from now. But regardless, our prayers are still important. And our hope for peace is still one that we carry in our hearts as people of faith. So we invite you to make time next Friday evening at 7 p.m. Tomorrow night, there is a congregational meeting via Zoom. Um, is that not actually a congregational meeting? It's a gathering of the congregation to talk about governance. And we would really be interested in hearing your experience, your wisdom, your concerns, as we consider how we can best update and model the governance that helps St. Andrews walk into the future. So do plan to join us. The details are in the newsletter, and if you want the direct link, you can use it online, either from the web page or from the newsletter that has been sent you. In North Bay, we gather to worship on the traditional territory of the Nipissing First Nation. And as we recognize that in worship, we are also giving thanks for their stewardship and their care of land. And we are also making a commitment to walk towards truth and reconciliation. Today, as we um, light the Christ candle on this Transfiguration Sunday, we are conscious that the stories we will hear are about the radiance and light of Christ being shown to his disciples and to the people. And we are conscious that as a community, we are called to show the light of Christ in our world. I invite you to join with me in the responsive call to worship. We, like disciples of old, are invited to go with Christ to the mountaintop. God, in this time of worship, bring us to the mountaintop. In worship, we too see the glory and light of Christ. Keep us awake to the Holy Presence. Let the light of its promise shine and transform. Let us praise your great and awesome name, Holy is Christ. We are singing in the light. See a humba. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching. 
marching in the house. We are 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 Well, hopefully that has woken you up. (laughs) Join with me in the gathering prayer. O radiant Holy One, who meets us on mountaintops of glory and in the plains of everyday life, you reveal to us the holy light of your love. Your amazing love lifts the veil from our face. As with each encounter, we are changed and transformed. May this time of worship cause our hearts to long to bask in your glory. Awaken us to see the power of your love, that we might walk in your way, moving among one another as a blessing and learning to move as a reflection of your divine presence, bearing light into dark places hope to displace there, and love that casts out hate. Maybe then we will hear your voice speaking to us and saying, listen to my child, beloved, as we share the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So today is Transfiguration Sunday, and in the Christian Church, not all of us celebrate Transfiguration Sunday on the same Sunday. In the Reformed tradition, it's always the Sunday before Lent, but in the Roman Catholic and Anglican traditions, it's actually later on in the church year. But today we will be hearing the story of Jesus going to the mountain and before his disciples actually being changed in appearance and what that signals for them. In Luke's Gospel, it's clear that this story is a turning point in Jesus' ministry. From then on, we are to understand that Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem. He knows where his ministry will lead him. In the verses that precede the story of the Transfiguration, Jesus has been sharing with his disciples some pretty hard stuff to understand. He's been talking about suffering and death. He's been talking about the fact that discipleship means that you might have to lose yourself in order to find your soul, that you might have to give up your life in order to find your life. And so the story begins with a time frame. 
a reference to the fact that nothing significant seems to have happened for a period of time between when Jesus shares with his disciples the things that they need to ponder and the events of the Transfiguration. So the story in Luke's Gospel goes like this. On the eighth day, Jesus took Peter and James and John up the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, his face was changed. And his clothes, they radiated with pure light, as white as snow, as brilliant as a flash of lightning. And two men came and stood with him. Moses and Elijah. And the three talked of the things that would come, that Jesus would fulfill his purpose in Jerusalem, and that the fulfillment of that purpose would include death. The disciples were weary and were dozing in and out of sleep. But they were suddenly awakened, and they heard the men talking. They saw Elijah and Moses in their glorious radiance. And then the two men were gone. And Peter said to Jesus, how good it is to be here with you. Surely we must build three booths to remember. One for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. Peter wasn't really thinking about what he was saying. And then a great cloud came and overshadowed them, enveloped them in its presence. And from the cloud they heard the voice. This is my chosen, my beloved. Listen to him. And then it was all over. The cloud had gone. Moses and Elijah had gone. And they were alone with Jesus. And the disciples were speechless. They didn't know what to say. And in fact, they told no one of what they had experienced that day. The next day, Jesus takes the disciples down the mountain to the place where the crowd had gathered. Those that had come seeking Jesus' presence and healing. And from the crowd, the voice of the man cried, Teacher, look at my son. He's my only child. He's inflicted with a spirit, a demon that causes him to convulse and throw himself on the ground, even foam at the mouth. And the spirit is relentless. It's taking over his life. I asked your disciples if they could drive the demon out, but they could not. And Jesus looks at the crowd and the disciples And he says, oh, you faithless, wearisome generation. How long do I need to be with you? How long do I have to put up with you? And then he said to the man, bring me your boy. And yet even as the child was coming to Jesus, The demon threw him on the ground in a convulsion, but Jesus drove out the spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And the crowd, they were amazed at the glory and greatness of God that they had witnessed. We sing of the same story as we sing our hymn together, we have 
come at Christ's own bidding. Heart. 
We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. These words are offered as wisdom for our journey. Let us walk I invite you to pray with me. Come, Spirit. Come in the words that are spoken. Come in the words that are heard. Come to our hearts, that we might know your truth abides with us. Amen. Sometimes there are those moments in life when it seems like the veil is lifted and all of a sudden we see and perceive in a new way. That's what the story of the transfiguration is about. It's about seeing and perceiving God's holiness in a new way. Not just for the three disciples that happened to be on the mountain with Jesus, but for Jesus himself. This is a moment of transition in his ministry. I'm hoping that phrase brings some familiarity with you. He now knows that he is not just about living this mission that he declared in the synagogue, but he is also about setting his face toward Jerusalem about bearing the suffering and the burden of revealing the glory of God. It's that transition moment from knowing that he has somehow been called to knowing the holiness that lives within him. And for his disciples, for Peter, James, and John that are there, it moves them from wondering if they are following the right one to an utter recognition with awe that Jesus is the chosen, the Messiah. The story starts with Jesus inviting just three of his 12 disciples to go up the mountain with him. What will become known in the Gospels really as the inner circle. This is normal for Jesus. When significant events are about to happen in his life, he finds a place of prayer. It's prayer that allows him to move deeper into the purpose of God for his life. It's prayer that allows him to remain obedient to that call. It's prayer that allows him to hear the voice. This is my beloved child, the chosen one. And it is prayer that moves him to clarity and action. So this is a normal pattern in the life of the disciples, to know that Jesus from time to time wanders off in place of prayer. And sometimes he invites some of them to go with, with him. But then Peter and James and John, well, it's been a hard few weeks. They're tired. And truth be known, they fall in and out of sleep as Jesus prays. But when they awaken, of course, they see that this is not just any day of prayer. That something significant is happening. They see Elijah and Moses in all of their glory. And they hear bits of the conversation. Enough 
for them to understand that the road ahead isn't going to be all that easy a one. And impetuous Peter. Impetuous Peter, well, he just wants to hold that moment close forever. He wants to stay in that holy place. And so he wants to build those monuments, booths, tents, cairns to Jesus and Moses and Elijah so that they might always remember this moment. You know, as United Church people in Northern Ontario, we know something about building cairns. Following the apology, the first apology to Indigenous people in Sudbury in 1986, a group of faithful people gathered and they planned and worked on building a cairn on the Laurentian University site. You know some of them. Stu Bell, Maxine McVeigh, who only just recently passed away, and Indigenous elder Art Solomon. Together they created this place that holds for us that transfiguration moment as a denomination. That moment when we found a direction, a call to ministry, and we began to walk in a new way and have a deeper sense of mission in our context and with Indigenous peoples. So maybe Peter, you know, didn't get it so wrong after all. But then Peter doesn't have a chance to build anything because another event overtakes him. And that's the cloud that comes and overshadows them, filled with God's voice that says, the one you saw with the shining all around him, he really is the chosen and beloved one. This is my son. This is the Messiah. So if we don't get to build a booth or a cairn, what exactly are we supposed to do with that piece of truth? That Jesus is the one. The one we've been hoping for, the one we've been looking for, the one we've been longing for. If Peter and James and John went up the mountain that day, wondering if there was more to this fellow Jesus from Nazareth whom they decided to follow, they got that assurance. You doubt? Look at him glowing with light. You doubt? Look at Moses and Elijah, that he is one of this prophetic line of God's Voices. You doubt? Hear the voice. The very voice of the Almighty proclaim, This is my beloved, my chosen. No need to doubt any longer. But if you believe, if you believe this truth, then listen. Listen to what he says. A few decades ago, a rather popular spiritual writer, Marianne Williamson, wrote a book called Return to Love. It was really about how one discovers one's inner light and love and lives that presence in the world. And in that book, she actually writes these words that I think might help us understand the transfiguration. We are all meant to shine as children. We are born to manifest the glory of God in our lives. Not just some of us, everyone. And when we shine with that light, we free others to shine. 
And when we shine beyond our fear, we not only liberate ourselves, we liberate others. So what if the voice of God that says, this is my beloved, my chosen, listen to him, is really saying, listen. Listen because he can teach you to shine just the way that he has shone before you. Listen. And he will show you the way to be God's light in the world. The Season Have Epiphany has two bookends, if you will. The first, it begins with the story of Jesus' baptism. When in prayer, following the baptism, Jesus hears the voice say, this is my beloved child, my chosen one. And this season of Epiphany ends with the story we read today of God in the clouds saying, this is my beloved one, my chosen one, and adding, listen to him. This season that has been about us discovering the glory of Christ ends with the invitation to participate in that light and glory. You see, that's what happens to Peter and the disciples when that cloud overshadows them. They're no longer just standing there looking at the holy thing happening over there in the corner where Jesus and Elijah and Moses are talking and there's a bright light glowing. Now they're actually taken into the cloud. Their lives are part of the holy story. Their discipleship is part of the holy witness. So that the Jesus who shines in glory on the mountaintop, well, that's the same Jesus who drives out what possesses that little boy and allows the crowd to see the glory and greatness of God in the every ordinary day lives that they live. Jesus doesn't come to stand as a monument. Jesus comes to enter the lives of others with light so that they too might shine. The holy enters the ordinary. That's the miraculous and glorious message of the gospel. God comes in a human being. And how does that light then shine through us? How do we go into the ordinary places of life where life is hard and there are demons to be driven out? How do we go into Ukraine and pray for peace when we see the devastation, when we fear the consequence? when we are uncertain about the future. We go with hope. We go with faith. We go believing that in the smallest acts of compassion and justice that we live, there the light of God might shine. This road of discipleship asks no less of us and no more of us than that. To shine as Christ shines. As a beacon of healing and hope. As a witness to God's faithfulness and presence. Not just on the mountaintop. Not just behind the veil not through the curtain of the Holy of Holies, not even exclusively on the visions of the heights, but in everyday life. 
in everyday life, the holy is here. This transfiguration story is meant to move us into the season of Lent, to empower us to walk with Christ the road that lies ahead. With, first of all, the assurance that the one we follow, well, he really is the one. He's the chosen. He's the beloved. He's the Messiah. He's love. And with the assurance that to be his disciples is to follow his path and to share the light of his way as we walk closer and deeper into the presence of God. May we have such a Lent. Thanks be to God. Bathe me in your light.
Um, my family, when I was four, my family moved to North Bay and became very involved in St. Andrews. And we went until I was 15. So I was confirmed in St. Andrews. My mom was choir leader at Shedley Mark Fleming, I Mark, sorry, was probably at the end before we moved. And that's where I started singing in the junior choir when I was eight. So we were very much in my parents were Herb and Jerry Griffin, and um, I love St. Andrews. I always have. So it's really great now that I'm retired from Nipissing to actually be working part time there. And everyone is wonderful, and thank you <laughs> for accepting me. So I'm here to talk about building use. And I started the end of April last year. I didn't really see any building use, but people kept warning me about it until August when the first movie location manager came in. And lucky for me, I have a volunteer steward <laughs> that I can basically go to when we, on their shoot days, we have to have a church volunteer there. And their shoot days can be from six to seven in the morning till 11 at night, 12, it can be overnight too, but um, it's really quite interesting. And then lucky for me, Stuart loves it. <laughs> I just sit in my office and I did meet one young actor a while back. I didn't know, but I don't know now. I mean, I'm not personally. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen him, sorry, I've seen him in a couple of films movies since I'm um, but it was really quite interesting because we do have, I have set up two separate costs. I have one for the movie people, which they say is reasonable, so I don't want to push it. <laughs> and one for the not-for-profit. So since August, the beginning of August, we've had five movies uh, shot in the church. When I was in the emergency, I got a call from another location. I met four location managers. Um, these are anywhere from Hallmark to now the new group, I don't know if you've heard, is called GAC, which is a new kind of competition for Hallmark. <laughs> and a lot of the Hallmark actors and actresses are moving over to GAC. Um, and we have one that is actually a small series, of a brand new one, started uh, two years ago, called when, uh, when Hope Calls, and it's filmed in Boston. And they have a sister show that was, it's in its ninth season this year, which is filmed in BC, where much of the filming, a lot of the filming is done for these movies. It's Christmas, so you see, it's big snow and everything around in the summer, maybe a lot of it done in the summer, but we actually have filming done right up to December, beginning of December. And the fifth one was a private independent group from Toronto that was filming. Um, we had basically from the start of September, we had up till December, in November and December, we ended up, we had 13 groups renting in the church. Anywhere from the Special Olympics, which, by the way, never did get here. <laughs> they were supposed to start coming in January, and that didn't happen. The Choral Society has been doing it all by Zoom, and they were supposed to be in in January, and as you know, that didn't happen, since we were shut down. But we had the Girl Guides. We had um, uh, support groups, the community support groups. We have three of those. One didn't end up happening because they didn't get any members coming to the church. But they paid us, so that was good. Uh, we had a volleyball, national volleyball girls team practicing. And the thing is that the most um, the most sought after room is the gym. So our choirs practice in the gym, the volleyball people loved our gym. 
didn't want to go back to schools or anywhere else. We got these people because the schools were still closed, their gyms were still closed. Um, but the, the movie people love the gym. And it's because of the light coming in our colored windows. And they use it as community centers. And they used it as a soup kitchen, kitchen community center for the last movie. But just to let you know, I went back Friday night and I went through all of our deposits from June uh, when the, uh, one of the sport groups started to the end of December. And just to let you know, our total of rentals was $17,441.10. And our total out of that for movies was $13,407.50. So two thirds of our money came from the movies. And as Sean was saying to me, he came in on Friday to, that was the first location manager, to, uh, to take pictures of the kitchen. And I said, well, Jim's not going to be done for a while. He's already looking for venues for five movies and casting for three weeks. They're going to start setting up and prepping in the beginning of March in another week. And they want to start filming at St. Andrews that we're hoping in April. And, you know, we've had to warn them we don't know when that's going to be. Because the gym is a big part. Um, so, yeah, it, it was quite interesting. Um, emergency calls, we were called for the club room for a baby shower because it was going to pour rain, and it did <laughs> that day. But it was wonderful. They cleaned everything up. And the other one was a funeral luncheon on a Monday, which I don't work on Mondays, so it was, uh, it was a little more difficult. But it was done, and they, they enjoyed it. And um, so you do get last minute. It was a last minute movie call on Friday for a shoot on Monday. And that one was an interesting story because they were supposed to shoot at the cathedral. But the cathedral lawyers got involved. Don't know why. I guess because Hallmark uses their own contracts. And the lawyers were really concerned about it as to who owned the IP. Well, not us. It's the movie's ownership of IP to understand intellectual property. So that was the sudden. It worked perfectly. The parlor was absolutely gorgeous. And it was a castle. It was an administration office for the princess's assistant in a castle in Europe. <laughs> so it was beautifully set. I actually had two real Christmas trees. And they cleaned up all the needles. So this is just part of it, but it does help the church. People love our building. As Sean says, I don't know if I have to go to use the gym in Trinity, but oh yeah, I'll do orders. I've been coming here for a <laughs> If I went, woo, you can't do that. So thank you for listening to me, and if you need anything, um, income tax receipts are ready to go. I haven't stamped them yet, and I'm doing that tomorrow and I'm not And uh, so I just wanted to let you know that. Is there any questions at all? Anybody? Give me a call. Send an email <laughs> to the church. Thank you very much. One of the reasons we asked Jan to share about how our building offers ministry and furthers the mission of the congregation is because she really does see this ministry of hospitality as something she does on our behalf. And um, to hear her interact with the folks that come in looking for 
not just face, but really someone to listen to their story. Jan does a wonderful job of representing us. We continue to offer our gifts to God. We offer them whether or not we pass the plates in worship. We offer them whether or not we are physically together in a time of gathering and worship. We offer them through what we are financially able to give. We offer them through what we give of our time and our talents. And we offer them through our very lives that we live in faith and hope. So we sing together, grant us God the grace of giving as we dedicate all of that offering that we bring. Grant us God the grace of giving, with the Spirit large and free. And we pray together. O God of all people and places, who created all the earth and called it good, we come bringing our gifts with the earnest prayer that you will bless them. Take these gifts, we ask you, and multiply them, so that the world may know the light of Christ in the midst of darkness. We pray boldly in Jesus' name. Amen. And sharing the prayers this morning is Kim. Creator, as we come to the end of Black History Month to speak and commit to anti-racism work beyond this month and find ways to honor this, we also honor the historical marginalization of Black people and continue to pray that it becomes just that. Standing here this morning, I recognize it can be hard to know what to say to God, knowing what is happening in our world at this time. But, we, but, we, but when we speak to the Creator, we do so with the knowledge that peace and unity is what Jesus desires. We pray fervently for the peace and the people in Ukraine. I read somewhere that God works by moving hearts to action. And with our prayers, we seek this. We pray that you watch over the people of Ukraine and that they feel your strength to stand another day and know that they are not alone and that the world is watching and praying. We pray that the civilians who have been displaced and for their families who have been separated from each other as they have sought safety. May they find solace under your wings. We pray for the world leaders and the leaders of Ukraine to guide them to have wisdom for the decisions that they make now and in the days to come. We pray for those who are protecting the Ukrainian citizens. May they receive wisdom, strength, and courage now and in the future. We pray for those who are responsible, that your spirit move their hearts so they see the suffering and Christ's desire for peace. We pray for your presence to bring peace to calm and to strengthen all involved with the courage to face these challenges with your spirit by their side, guiding them to care for your people, all peoples. Above all, Creator, we pray for peace in you. Before we sing Travel On, Travel On as our concluding hymn this morning, I want to just um, bring to your attention two other small things that I should have at the beginning. Uh, one is that the reopening and worship team and property folks, a uh, few of us were able to gather earlier in the week, and we are going to be here next Sunday uh, and really hope that we will be back at St. Andrew's Sanctuary on the 13th of March. 
So because we are here, there will not be communion next Sunday. We will find a time during the Lenten season when we will celebrate communion, but we will do that when we are back at St. Andrews. And Lent does begin this Wednesday with Ash Wednesday, and there will be a noon hour service in the parlor at St. Andrews, and it's warm. The parlor is the warmest room in the building. Uh, uh, and so uh, we invite you to come and join in a time of marking the beginning of Lent as we do Ash Wednesday together. Travel on, travel on. as it seems. There is glory hidden in everything, waiting to be revealed to the eyes of those who believe beyond what seems inevitable, beyond what seems status quo, the glory of the promise of God. So hold on to that vision as we turn this week towards slant as we walk the more difficult path. For there is the assurance that there is yet even more glory to be revealed. So go in peace. Go in hope. And go in love.
Thank you.